Now this is a bit of a different intro than usual, and that's because I'm going to show you how to build a Zoom clone where you can communicate on video chat with anyone you want. As you can see, I have my phone and my computer. I'm talking with both of them, and this could be used to call anyone that you want. So let's get started now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified times four. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now to get started, I just have a blank project open in Visual Studio Code and a working demo of the project on the right. As you can see in this top browser, I am calling myself in this chat room with this title. And then also down here, I have that same chat room open. And if I were to join that chat room with another tab, you can see that now all three of these windows have the three different calls inside of them. And if I were to leave, it'll exit that person out of the other chats. So as you can see, this is a very flexible and useful video calling platform. And it's automatically going to create rooms for us so that we can chat in specific rooms instead of calling every single person on the application. So to get started with this, the very first thing that I want to do is to actually set up our project because we're going to need some form of server to help us communicate the rooms that we have for our different users. And then we're going to need obviously our front end code for talking with the different users in the video chat. So in order to get our server set up, let's just run npm init dash y. That's going to create for us this boilerplate package.json. And now we need to install our dependencies. So we can say npm i. And the first dependency that we're going to need is express because that's going to be the server we're going to use. And we're going to use ejs as our templating language. So we'll use that dependency. And then we're going to need something called socket.io, which is going to allow us to communicate back and forth with the actual server easily. Now, another dependency that we're going to need is going to be UUID. So we can just say npm i UUID. And this dependency is what allows us to create these dynamic URLs right here with these different room numbers inside of them. So we can just have dynamic, unique UUIDs for all of our different rooms so the users can chat in specific rooms. Lastly, we're going to need one dev dependency. So npm i dash dash save dev. And this is going to be called nodemon. And this allows us to quickly refresh our application every single time we make changes so we don't have to manually restart our server each and every time. And speaking of our server, let's create a server.js file where all of our server code will go. And now in our package JSON, let's create a script. We're going to call it dev start. And we're just going to inside of here put nodemon server.js. And now if we come down here and we were to run npm run dev start, it's going to run this server file and every single time we make changes, for example, console.log hi and rerun it, you can see it's going to log that out and restart our server. Now inside of our server, I just want to set up the very basic code for actually getting our server running. So we can just create a express server by saying const express is equal to require express. And then we can create an app variable, which is equal to running that express function. And we're also going to need to get a server, which is useful for socket IO. So we can say server is equal to require of HTTP. And we just need to pass in here dot server and then pass our actual app object here. This allows us to create a server to be used with socket IO. And speaking of socket IO, let's bring that in. So we'll say IO is equal to require of socket dot IO. And we need to pass in the server to the return of this require function. So this actually creates a server for us based on our express server and then passes that to socket IO so that socket IO actually knows what server we're actually using and how to actually interact with that. And then what we can do is we can say server dot listen on port 3000 and that's actually going to start up our server on port 3000. But in order to get that to work, I need to shut down my existing server on port 3000. So there we go, I've shut down that other server, but you'll still notice these videos are actually working. And that's because the video chat does not communicate through the server. It actually communicates directly with the person's computer. So we don't have to worry about sending our traffic through the server. The server is purely just for setting up our rooms. And now if we just get rid of this, go to localhost 3000, this is going to be where our application is when we actually start it up. So if we save over here and if we refresh, you should see cannot get slash. And that's exactly what we want. Now, the next step is to actually set up our express server. So we actually have a route at this home page here. We can just say app.set, and this is going to be for our view engine. We need to set up how we're going to render our views. In our case, we downloaded the EJS library, so we're going to use EJS. Next, we want to make sure we set up our static folder. So we can say app.use express.static, whoops, static, 
and this is going to be called the public. So we're going to put all of our JavaScript and CSS all in this public folder here. So now that we have that set up, we can actually work on this git route here. So we can just say app.git of slash, and this is going to take in a request and a response. So let's just say request and response. And then with that request and response, all that we want to do is create a brand new room and redirect the user to that room because we don't have a home page for this application. So if you go to the home page, it's just going to create a brand new room for you. So let's create a route for our rooms. We can say app.git slash colon room. And this is going to be a dynamic parameter that we pass into the URL. And it's going to again take request and a response. And inside of here, what we can do is we can actually get our room from this room parameter here. So we can say res.render room, and we want to pass down our room ID. And this room ID is just request.params.room. And that's coming right here from our URL. Now up here, we can take our response and we can redirect our user to slash room, but we want to get a dynamic room. So we can come in here slash, and then we want to have some form of room ID here that we pass in. And that's what that UUID library we downloaded is going to do. So we can say const, and we need to say require here. It's going to be equal to UUID. And inside of here, what we're going to do is we're going to take a function called v4, and we're just going to rename it to UUID v4. That way, it's more self-explanatory what it does. And instead of passing this room ID here, we can call the UUID v4 function, and that's going to give us a dynamic URL. So now if we save and we go to localhost 3000, we should actually get a random UUID being appended to the end of this. So if I hit enter, you can see down here, we have this random UUID that looks just like this being appended to the end of our URL. If we come down here, same thing, we should get another random UUID. If I just copy that in, you can see we have two completely random rooms that are generated every single time we go to our home page. And now it's saying that we don't have any view essentially that it's rendering. We are trying to render this view called room, but we don't have a view called room yet. So let's work on creating that view. We can create a new folder called views. This is by default where your views are going to go. We'll create a new file called room.ejs. And that's because we're using the EJS view engine. Now inside of here, if we hit exclamation point and hit tab, you can see it generates boilerplate HTML code for us. And inside of here, we can actually go through and render all of the code we need for our room view. Now, luckily for us, this is actually really simple code. We're going to need to have some grid, which we're going to put our videos. We're going to call this video grid. And then we're going to have some really simple styles for styling out this video grid. So we can say video grid. And this video grid is going to be a display of grid. We're going to have grid template columns, which we're going to say repeat on auto fill. And we want to have 300 pixels. So essentially, we're going to have a 300 pixel wide video. And then we're going to say grid auto rows. And we want to have 300 pixels. And what this is saying is that every single one of our rows should be 300 pixels tall, and every single one of our columns should be 300 pixels wide. So essentially, we're going to get a square video. Now, in order to make sure our video fills that whole space, we can select all of our video elements. We can change the width to 100%, the height to 100%. And it, to, in order to account for aspect ratios, for example, if you have a really skinny video or a really wide video, you want to make sure it still only is a square. So we can say object fit and set that to cover. Essentially what that's going to do is it's going to zoom in the video until it fills the entire square and then cut off everything around the edges. It's just like if you did background sizing and you did covering that way, it's the same thing. And that right there is all of the code that we need to set up our styles. As I said, it's really simple styles. It's just a grid of video objects. So now if we save that and we save over here and we just do a quick back to our homepage and refresh, you can see we have a random room ID generated and it's just going to be a blank page which has that one single empty video grid div on it. Now the next thing that I want to work on before we start diving into the front end is going to be thinking about what we want to handle on our server with socket IO. So if we just come down here, we can say io.on connection. This is going to run anytime someone connects to our web page. We want to just admit socket. That's the actual socket that the user is connecting through. And here we can actually set up events to listen to. So the first event I want to listen to is going to be when someone connects to a room. So we can say socket.on join room. And inside of here, we're going to pass in the room ID 
as well as the user ID. So what this essentially does is what happens is whenever we connect with Socket.io, we're going to set up this event listener that says whenever we join a room, we're going to pass in the room ID and the user ID. So on the front end, what happens is as soon as everything is set up and we have a room and we have a user, we're going to call this join room event here, and then it's going to call all the code inside of this socket.on. For now, I'm just going to console log room ID and user ID so we can see exactly what's happening, and we'll just save that for now. Now, instead of our room EJS, what we need to do is we need to take the room ID that we pass in here, and we need to give it to our front end code somehow. And the easiest way to do that is just simply with a script tag inside of here, what we can do is we can say const room ID is going to be equal to, and we want to have this syntax here with the less than sign, the percent and equal, that's going to actually render code on our server. So we know we have room ID being passed down from our server here. So we can access that inside of here just like this, close that off, and we need to wrap this inside of quotes because it's actually going to be a string. So now in our JavaScript, we're going to have this room underscore ID variable. We can actually see that by if I just refresh here and inspect the page, go over to our console and type in room ID, you can see that this room ID here matches exactly the URL right here, 48FA, 48FA. So we're actually getting the room ID that we're currently in and we're passing that down through this room underscore ID variable. Now the next thing we need to do after that is make sure we can use socket IO inside of the front end. And luckily, Socket.io does all of this automatically. We can create a script tag here, and it's going to have a source of slash. And we want to go to socket.io slash socket, whoops, socket.io.js. And let's just make sure we defer that. And what this essentially is doing is loading all of the Socket.io JavaScript code into our front end, and it's serving it from our own server here. That's what happened when we set up our IO with our server like this. So now we have that socket IO code. And the last thing to do is to set up our own custom script. We'll just call it script.js and we'll make for sure to defer this. So now we have access to some script file, which is going to come from a public folder, which we need to make sure is at the root level. And we'll create a file in here called script.js. Now inside of here, we have access to all of our socket IO code. We have access to our room ID. And with that, we can actually call that socket IO join room event right here. So inside of our script, let's first get a reference to socket. We can just say socket is going to be equal to IO. And then we need to pass in the path that we want to call. In our case, we're just going to use the root path because that's where our server is set up at the root path. So we have socket is going to connect to our root path of our application at localhost 3000. And then what we can do is say socket.emit. And this is going to send an event to our server. We're going to call it join room. And inside of here, we need to pass our different arguments. So we have our room ID, and let's just pass a user ID of 10 for now so that we can see if this works. So now if we save and we refresh over here, you should see that we get past our room ID as well as our user ID. And that's because here we're printing that out whenever a user joins the room. If we join this other room down here with a different browser, you can see that we get that room ID as well as that hard-coded user ID of 10. So now the next thing to work on is actually telling all of the other users in the same room that we have joined, that we have a new user that just connected because we need to set up the video connections. So to do that, first we want this current socket to join a room. So we can say socket.join room ID. So now we're joining this new room that we passed up here with this current user. So anytime something happens on this room, we will send it to this socket or essentially this user. And then we can say socket .to room ID, which means we're going to send a message to the room that we are currently in. We want to make sure this is a broadcast message. All this does is says send it to everyone else in the same room, but don't send it back to me because we already know that we connected. We don't need to send ourselves a message saying we connected. And then we can just say emit here, and this is going to be our event, which is user connected. And we're going to pass in the ID of that user that just connected. So now we can go back into our script and we can actually listen for this event. So we can say socket.on user connected, and this is going to take in a user ID. And then what we can do is we'll just say console.log user connected, and we're gonna pass it the user ID for now, just to see what this is actually doing. So if we save and we just inspect our page here, go to our console, and if we refresh, you'll notice nothing's actually happening. And if we refresh down here, nothing's happening. But if we have this user down here at the bottom join the exact same room as the user at the top, 
you'll see user connected 10, which is the user ID that we have hard coded. So now when people are in the exact same room, we're sending messages to other people in the same room saying, hey, someone else joined, here's the ID that they have, so you can try to connect to them. But so far, all we've done is just hard code these IDs. We just have 10 hard coded here. So how exactly are we going to handle this ID connection? Well, there are a few different ways we could do it. One way would be to hard code and write out all of the code by hand that we need to do to set up these fancy connections, or we could take advantage of a library that's already built that does a lot of the hard work for us. And this library is called PeerJS. They have the ability to create connections between different users using WebRTC, and most importantly, they have a server set up that you can use that allows you to create these dynamic IDs for connecting between different users. And to set up that server is incredibly easy. Just open up a new tab in your terminal, and we're gonna run npm i-g, and we wanna call peer. What this is going to do is globally install this peer library, which allows us to actually run a peer server. And then we can just say peer JS, as in a port, we'll say port 3001. And now what happens is we have a peer server running on port 3001. And what this peer server allows us to do is to connect different users and it'll give us an ID of a user, which we can use here instead of this hard coded number 10. But we also need to make sure that we include this script tag here inside of our code. So let's copy this script tag, come over to our room EJS, we'll just put it way at the top of our code, and we'll just make sure that we set this to defer so it loads in the correct order from top all the way down to bottom. Now if we save that, come into our script, we have access to that peer library, and we can create a new peer. But since we're connecting to our own server, we need to pass some parameters to this new peer. So let's create a peer, we'll call it my peer. It's going to be equal to a new peer. And this first parameter to peer is going to be an ID. We'll just pass in undefined because we're going to let the server take care of generating our own ID. Now the next thing that we pass to this is going to be our host. In our case, our host is just this slash here. We just want it to be our root host. And then a port, which is in our case going to be 3001. We're just going to put that inside of a string here. So now we have a connection to this peer server. And if I were to just save this and I refresh my browser, you can see client connected and it's giving us an ID for our client. If we come over here, you should see the same thing, client connected and a new random ID for that user. So now we're actually connecting to this peer server. And all this peer server does is it takes all of the web RTC information for a user and it turns it into this really easy to use ID, which we can pass between different places and use with this peer library to actually connect with other peers on the network. So now with that setup, what we can use is we can say my peer dot on open. And what this is saying is as soon as we actually connect with our peer server and get back an ID, we actually want to run this code. And this is actually going to pass us the ID of our user. And inside of here, let's move up our join room code and we'll pass in that user ID whenever we actually join. So now if we save, come back over here and we go over to our other terminal so we can see what our user information is. We refresh here and we refresh down here and we inspect the console, you can see that it says user connected and it actually has an ID of a user. And this is a unique ID. If I were to refresh this page, you can see I get a brand new ID because it's a new user being connected to this exact room. So now we actually have IDs that we can use to connect between our different users and actually make calls between them. So now let's get into the fun part of this application, which is setting up that video call connection. And the first step is to render our own video on the screen. So that's actually fairly straightforward to do. The first thing I want to do is get a reference to that grid. So we can just say document.getElementById. We just call it video grid. This is going to have the place where we place all of our new videos. And then we also want to get reference to a video. So we'll say const my video is equal to document.createElement. And we want to create a video element. But most importantly, we want to make sure that we take my video and we want to mute this. So we're going to say muted is equal to true because obviously we don't want to listen to our own video. That really doesn't make sense. So we're going to make sure we mute ourselves. And this isn't going to mute us for other people. It just mutes the video for ourselves. So we don't have to hear our own microphone play back to us because obviously that would be really, really annoying. Now, the next step, once we have that done is to actually try to connect our video. So we can just say navigator.mediadevices.getUserMedia. And what this is going to do is take a options parameter here, this object, and we need to say that we want to get video. So we'll say video true. 
and we want to get audio, so we'll say audio true, because we want to get our video and audio to send to other people. And this is a promise, so it's gonna say dot then, and it's gonna pass us a stream. And this stream is going to be our video and our audio. And we want to tell our video object that we've created here to actually use that stream. So let's create a function to do that. We'll just come all the way down to the bottom here, and we'll say add video stream. And this is gonna take in a video, and it's gonna take in a stream. And now all this is gonna do is it's gonna take our video, we're gonna set our source object equal to that stream. This will allow us to play our video. And then we wanna add an event listener to our video. So I'll say add event listener. This is gonna be on loaded metadata, just like that. And this is gonna be a function. And all we want to do when this is done, whoops, there we go, is we just wanna say video.play. Essentially what's saying is once it loads this stream and this video is actually loaded on our page, we want to play that video. Then what we wanna do is we wanna take our video grade and we wanna just append our video onto the grid of videos we already have. Now, if I save this, come up here and make sure we call that add video stream function with my video and a stream, we should actually see our video being appended to our page. And as you can see, that video just popped up and you may need to actually approve the camera permissions. As you can see I here, I have it allowing my camera to be used. And the first time you load the page, it'll ask for permission to use your camera and microphone, but I've already given myself permission on localhost 3000, so I don't need to see that pop up, but you most likely will see that, so don't be alarmed. That's perfectly normal and just browser behavior. Now, the next thing we need to do is once our stream and video is set up, we need to allow ourselves to be connected to by other users. So we need to again use socket IO, whoops, socket.on, and we need to do this user connected event. The one that we have down here where we're just printing out our user and it's going to take in a user ID. So we already have this event set up on our server working properly. So we can get rid of this test code down here. And when a new user connects, we're gonna call a function called connect to new user. And we're gonna pass in our user ID as well as our video stream that we want to send to that user that we're trying to connect to because a new user has joined our room. So we have to send our current video stream to that user. So let's just come down here. We'll create that function. Function connect to new user. It's taking a user ID and a stream. And now inside of this function, we're gonna create a variable called call. And this call variable is coming from our peer object. So our peer up here, we're gonna call a function called call. And what this function does is essentially it's going to call a user that we give a certain ID to. So we can say our user ID, and we're gonna pass it the stream we want to send to that user. So we're calling this user with this ID and sending them our video and audio stream. And then we want to listen to the event called stream. And what this event is saying is when we call this user, we're gonna send them our video stream. And then when they send us back their video stream, we're gonna get this event here called stream, which is gonna take in their video stream. So it's going to say, you know, user video stream. In this user video stream, we want to just add to our list of videos. So we can say add video stream. And we want to add our user video stream as our stream. And we're going to create a new video object. So we'll say const video is equal to document.create element of video. So we can pass that video instead of here. So now what's happening is we're taking the stream from the other user that we're calling and we're adding it into our own custom video element on our page. And lastly, we're gonna to have to listen to on close. And this close event, all we want to do is just remove the video. So we can say video.remove. And what this close is listening for is essentially whenever someone leaves the video call, they're gonna close that call and we want to make sure that we remove their video so we don't just have random videos laying around from people that aren't connected anymore. So now if we save, I'll refresh this and everything should still work. We have our video. And if we go to the same room down here, refresh, you should see we get the video here. But as you can see, even though we're calling the other user, we don't have their video showing up. And the reason for that is that we're not actually listening to when we get called. What we need to do is listen to when someone tries to call us on this my peer object. So we can do that inside of here. We can say my peer dot on call. So when someone tries to call us, we're going to get this call object we can work with. All we want to do is answer their call and we're going to send them our current stream. So we're going to answer their call and send them our stream. So now let's see what happens. We refresh this top one, refresh this bottom one. You can see this top browser is getting sent the video from the bottom browser up because a user connected. 
but our bottom browser is not having any information about the top browser. And the reason for that is we answered the call from our one peer, but we're not actually responding to any video streams that come in. So we need to say call.onStream, and we need to do pretty much the same exact thing. This is going to be our other user video stream. And then this, we need to first come up here, create a new video object to place this. So we'll say document.createElement, which is a video. And we just need to make sure we add that video stream, which is going to be our video element, as well as our user video stream. Now, everything should work. If we refresh this browser, you can see we get just ourself, we refresh down here, and now we have both of these browsers communicating with one another. So what's happening is we're able to receive calls by listening to our on-call event, and we're also able to make calls when new users connect to our room. And if this user was, for example, in a different room called room, you can see that no matter how many times I refresh this, they're not added up here. But as you can see by this frozen video on the right, we're not actually closing our connection as well as we should be. So we need to make sure we try to handle our video closes so that it works a little bit quicker than as you can see, it took quite a while to disappear. So in order to do this, we need to go back to our server and inside of this socket.onjoin room, what we wanna do is say socket.onDisconnect. We want to run another function and this function is going to be whenever our user disconnects from the server. So this is handled by Socket.io. So essentially if I were to click the X button and leave completely or go to a different URL or whatever it is, socket.io.onDisconnect is going to get called. And inside of here, I just wanna send an event down to our room. So just like before we have socket.2 room ID, I want to make a broadcast event and I wanna emit a new event called user disconnected. I'm gonna pass in the ID of the user that disconnected. So now if I just come into my script, we can just listen to that event. We'll come all the way up here, socket.on user disconnected. We should get a user ID. I just want to console.log out the user ID. So now, if we put both of these users in the exact same room, refresh everything, we should get two videos. Now, if we inspect, come over to our console, and we have this bottom person leave by going to a different room. So we'll go to room again. You can see we get that ID pre printed out of the user that just left. So now we can use that ID to try to remove the video call of that person since we no longer are connected to them anymore. So in order to do that, let's come into our script here and we need to keep track of which people we have contacted and what call they have set up. So here, when we connect to a new user, we're gonna to need to save some form of variable that tells us what the call is that we just made to that user so that we can remove it. So what we can do is create a variable. We'll just come up here we can say const peers is gonna be equal to an empty object. And then all the way down here, when we connect to a user, we can just say peers of that user ID is going to be equal to the call that we just created. So now essentially every user ID is directly linked to a call that we make. So now whenever we disconnect from a user, what we can do is we can say peers of the user ID dot close. And this is going to close our connection. And we just wanna make sure that we only do this if we have a user. So we can say if peers of user ID exist. So if this is true, then what we want to do is close the connection. Otherwise, if this is not true, then we don't actually have a connection to close, so it doesn't make sense to call close. So now, refresh down here, refresh down here, and make sure that they're in the same exact room. You can see we have both users, and now if this user leaves the room, you can see that immediately the video was completely removed from up here, and there was no long delay that we had to wait for. And that's all it takes to create your own Zoom clone. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other project-based videos linked over here, and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.